Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. In this episode, we've got an X86 PC in a handheld form factor with handy grip mounted controls with a touchpad, a touchscreen, a full slide out keyboard, and it's from 2005. Go on, who else thought it was a Steam Deck? So this in particular is the VGN UX70, which is an example of Sony's ultra portable mobile computer, which first came out in 2006. And I can remember seeing one of these in a department store. Unfortunately, this was a little bit later and it had Windows Vista on it, but I try not to hold that against it. This particular one came designed for Windows XP and it's still awesome. I think this one had 512 gig of memory, uh, a 1.2 gigahertz processor, built-in Wi-Fi with handy pop-out antenna. In true Sony style, they went with the memory stick duo because SD cards weren't clearly going to be the winner at that point. Uh, it still has that weird, do you remember this point in time where you had physical wireless switches? Still never really understood why that was a thing. Uh, a locking power switch, not unlike the PSP. Uh, and it could come with a dock, which could have extra accessories like a floppy drive or a CD drive. I think this one had a 40 gig hard drive in it. And of course, the obligatory built-in stylus. Admit it, if you knew one of these existed and it wasn't prohibitively expensive, you'd have wanted one in 2006. I mean, this is 2022 and I'm still excited to have this. On top of the standard bells and whistle whistles, it's also got a fingerprint sensor, Windows Hello in Windows 10, uh, a macro mode for its front and rear facing cameras. I mean, when the first iPhone came out, it didn't have a front facing camera. It's got extra buttons to actuate the camera. It's got extra zoom in and zoom out because I think this was a, an 800 by 600 or thereabouts um, screen, which was quite small in this size. Shortcuts for the keyboard and of course, oh, full size QWERTY. I mean, Blackberry eat your heart out. Anyway, we're not here to look at it. We're here to take it apart. So I think I need to take the stylus out because there's a screw behind it. So battery also has to come out. So this came broken. Um, I have actually spent more time than I perhaps should have done trying to get Windows XP installed on it. And the best I managed was, if you've installed Windows XP like me, hundreds of times you'll know exactly what I mean. It's when you enter it actually into the Windows GUI to do the completion steps like uh, detecting hardware, finalizing the setup, enter the license, and it got through the final steps before it crashed. And I think based on the graphical glitches that came with it, or when I started the installation process again, even in the DOS-based earlier bits, or command line, sorry Microsoft, earlier bits, the graphical artifacts were starting to show, and this shared RAM with the graphics card. So I'm hoping we'll find out it's either a DUF memory card, or it just might not be seated right, or need re... Um, need reseating and I think it was getting a little bit hot. Maybe it's some tin that needs reapplying and it will be a quick fix. So let's get the case off and have a look at what we're dealing with. Now the question is, because I think this came out before there was proper system on a chip hardware and like I say, this is an x86 architecture. What or how did they manage to cram that into this size form factor? What sort of compromises were made? How? Because this is a phys physical spinning hard disk. Hey, it's a 60 gig hard drive, although worryingly written on it 60 gig, which makes me think this may have been an aftermarket or a repaired hard drive. Oh, fairly standard um, mini PC, PCI Wi-Fi card with links to antennas. Did wonder if that was all just gonna lift out. Oh look, there's the gate for the... It's not a PCMCIA card at this point, is it a uh, mini PC card? Is that what the successor was that never really landed because everybody started having USB? No, the screen doesn't look happy about that. So I'm going to reseat that now for now. Okay, let's get the hard drive out. So 60 gigabytes, that's not even a two and a half inch hard drive. I think that's a 1.8 inch hard drive. 
And I think that's going to be IDE, or mini IDE. The really, really tiny one. Okay, let's get the antenna coaxes off. Don't know whether that disappears to this sort of bumper on top, which I think also has uh, an IR blaster in it. Because that takes me back. Single thing is just full of nostalgia. There you go, there's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. That's a standard module. Intel wide, wireless, nothing special. It'll be interesting to see if I've got a slightly newer one stashed away somewhere. This hard drive, wow. Actually on a ribbon. I'm not sure I've ever seen a hard drive on a ribbon before. Even my creative Zen Touch, which was better than the contemporary iPod I hasten to add, both in battery life and sound quality, had a little 1.8 hard a eight inch hard drive that was about this size. And even that came with the proper like IDE connector on the end of it. Yeah, that is a 60 gig spinning hard drive. 500 milliamp, 3.3 volts. Um, what speed is it? I'm interested as to the revolution speed. So enterprise grade spinning disks like the Raptor used to be 10,000 RPM. Um, a normal desktop drive would be 7,200 RPM. Laptop drives were 5,200, some of the lower end ones went to 4,800 RPM. But I have no idea what speed this would run at. So there is an Intel, Intel IC, let's call it that for the time being. I'm not sure if that's gonna be the system on a chip, uh, system on a chip, whether that's gonna be a processor, whether that's gonna be a north bridge. It's not got a heat sink, which makes me think it's not the main processor. That appears to be the system battery. Tiny little coin cell on a pair of leads wrapped up in a little bit of protective tape. So that will have lost its <laughs> time now. It's just bananas. So this USB port appears to be on a daughter board as well. I mean, the actual port is fitted to a daughter board, but it's also on a flex PCB, which wraps around to the other side of the board, but also has this connector on it. Wow, look, that USB port onto this daughter board onto this PCB, the flex PCB or ribbon, which also connects to the hard drive, which connects to that port. But is that, that a power bus which runs underneath? Just crazy stuff. Similar arrangement down here by the looks of things. So I pop that out, yeah. So that's the mobile PCIe, the docking port on this high density connector and the power barrel jack all onto this Flex PCB, which connects there, but also runs under the board. Who designed this? Who thinks like this? I'll tell you what, let's take that microphone off. My biggest concern on the underside here is this ribbon for the screen. I can't see a clear way yet of disconnecting that. Oh, there we go. Okay. Whew. So let's focus on the computery bit of it, and we'll come back to all of the screen and keyboard assembly afterwards. Um, I think all the screws are out of this. Uh, no, screwed into both sides. So, okay, let's lay that top side down. Look, proper heat pipes on a heat sink as well. This thing is, continues to prove to me it's over-engineered. I'm, again, struggling with the order of assembly here because this metal plate seems to be under and over things at the same time, and I'm not even sure how you would do that, why you would do that. Um, okay, so this was only connection was this little ribbon, which came from either the hard drive or the USB port. Oh no, I suppose, I suppose that connector could actually connect to the high density, which then sandwiched into the other board. Very confused for a second there. So this is actually a heat spreader, yeah. It's got a thermal pad to that, which could be GPU or CPU. Similarly, that one with the heat sink on it makes me think that's probably the, that's probably the CPU. So another ZIF connector there. And then audio board. Which again, it's just connected up using these ribbon connectors. They make fantastic use of this and it's just a, a concept which I don't think would occur to me. Oh, there you go. Oh, okay. So a respectable heatsink fan there. It's um, it a heat pipe up from the CPU. Fan draws the heat. But yeah, I reckon if that's the graphics card and it just goes to the heat spreader, there's not great heat dissipation. So we've got a few bits of sort of uh, shielding here. 
I think that's just shielding some components from others. Ah, uh, that's a shame. The memory... I mean, it... <laughs> I don't know what this says about me, but I've just seen a, a half the word Hynix written on the board. One of these ICs, and I've just gone, oh, there's the RAM. But that still feels likely. Lots of regulators on there. Good high quality components used throughout, but then Sony, what would you expect? Okay, that's the computer part. So, keyboard and screen. I mean, the screen connector... I really don't like it when a ribbon cables used to make that motion. It makes me feel very uneasy. So over here we've got sort of one of those leany leany mouse bits. You know, do you do you remember when computers used to have that sort of felt nipple in the middle of the keyboard that was the mouse, and you just sort of pushed and leaned it to one side and up and down to make it go? Well, it's the same sort of felt covered arrangement here. It's just on one side, and then you've got your mouse buttons clicking here. Be interesting to get all of that out and see what it looks like from the inside. Oh, so I was wrong. I thought that would have an IR transmitter and receiver on it, but no, they are just antennas for the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, because that one, if you remember, came down here to the Wi-Fi chip up there. Whereas this one is coming over here, which makes me think that's Bluetooth. Imagine this board is reasonably dumb. Yeah, it's got the Wi-Fi switch and a couple of tactile switches. I mean, it's got the connector for the Bluetooth module on the back, but it doesn't do much in itself. So down here is the mouse, or at the very least the plate that made it rigid enough to work. The trouble is they've got a tactile switch on a daughter board right here, a tactile dome, um, and I can't see a way of getting that out without ripping the flexible PCB that's attached to it. Aha! Okay, so I needed to sort of get the felty nipple off first. <laughs> I really wasn't expecting the screen to come off at this point, but there it is. And there is that tiny slidey little mouse. I mean, you can't even see any movement on there. And I've never looked up how they work before. If I had to guess now, I would imagine it's like a piezo, almost like a pressure transducer, where you sort of, when you're leaning it to one side, it's applying pressure and that will generate a voltage. That I see on that little daughter board from the left side, as we're looking at it, it would have been the right side in the normal work use, is presumably a controller for the mouse. So it's just a single connector right here that brings all the keys, the Bluetooth, the mouse, back to the main board. And I don't think we need to take cover off of this just to know there's a load of tactile domes hiding under plastic caps, which is cool, but not that I want to spend the rest of my week putting plastic buttons back in. Sorry. So this this has got speaker, camera, camera, fingerprint scanner, and the sliding mechanism, which okay. So four screws, one, two, and the top two, which were these two. That's surprisingly lightly fixed. So to get Windows, or try and get Windows reinstalled in this, I originally started looking for the recovery disks or CDs or images that anybody may have shared up or online. Um, I managed to find a recovery image for a later model. I think it was the uh, 250 instead of the 70. Um, and I managed to get that flashed to a USB drive, only to be told that this image was not compatible with the computer, please stop now. Um, so that didn't work. Uh, and I had the most luck just trying to install Windows XP just from a, a flash drive, which seemed to be working the best, but I don't know how many custom Sony apps were installed on this. In this case, not as bloatware, but actual to make this thing function, like the, the drivers for the touchscreen, the calibration software for the touchscreen, because this is a resistive touchscreen, not capacitive. Um, the drivers were mostly available. I managed to track down those. But software to make the zoom key buttons work, things like that, I dare say are much harder to come by. <laughs> this little row of LEDs to illuminate all the, the hard drive caps lock, num lock keys on here. Oh no. <sighs> that rear facing camera screw has just stripped. And I don't know if I'll get it with a bigger screwdriver or not. No. Just got to be very careful here not to scratch the screen. No, and I'm not going to tempt fate by trying to tease that out. Sorry, we will just have to chalk that up to 
use your imagination. <laughs> I believe the front and rear camera are the same module, so if you can see this one, we're good. Okay, that's the screen out. Oh, it's a sharp screen with a custom back board because it's got this daughter board on it. Like I said, that presents the, the, the caps lock, hard drive, activity light and things. But that's actually integrated onto the display control. So they've actually made use of that despite the fact it's sharp branded. Wow. The depth that Sony have gone to to integrate so many components in ways which are clearly not linear thinking. The, the, the idea of using sort of the, the ribbon connectors as pass-throughs to mount various ports to one high density connector to pass through to another tiny board on the bottom which didn't connect to anything else. It's just crazy. I mean, how did they come up with some of these, these thought processes? And then to physically aggregate that into a tiny package, which even if you could see this today, I think you'd have to agree is kind of cool. Now, I'm clearly going to spend way too much time trying to put this all back together again and see if I can debug what I hope is just an overheating graphics chip. Could be a memory issue. Look, I, I hope you found this an interesting teardown. I've loved it. Um, this is a machine that's fascinated me since I first saw one 17 odd years ago. But if you found this was a disappointment and you think we must buy a Steam Deck to tear down, head over to the Element 14 community and petition everybody over there to make sure that we do that in the future. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.